joining us online or in person, we just want to say welcome. You're about to hear an incredible message from our senior pastor, Chad Braswell. But before that, I want to encourage you, if you're watching online, make sure to like, comment, and share this video so that other people can watch as well. Thank you again for being with us today, and we hope you enjoy this message. Good morning, Metro Church. How are you? You doing well? It is good to see you. Man, I'm glad to be back together in person. Last week, we were glad technology could, you know, keep us together, but we're glad to be in the house, aren't we? Very, very exciting. Uh, how many are already wishing that the, whatever he is, Punxsutawney Phil would have said that spring's coming sooner. Anyone else on that? Yeah, he's only 40% accurate for those keeping stats. But, uh, but I'll tell you, I'm ready for winter to end. I don't want any reason to keep us out of God's house. And uh, the snow is pretty from a distance. Anyone already ready, done shoveling, ready to see it? You know, I'll tell you, once we get past Christmas, I'm done. I'm done. You're like, it hasn't even started yet. I'm done. I'm done. We're going to pray and get into a brand new series today. I'm really excited about it. Come on, let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your presence. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, who gives us access to you, God. We're thankful, Lord, for all that you have in store today. This isn't a coincidence that we find ourselves hearing your voice today as we're in the house. We pray that you would uh, bless us, that you would help us see what you want us to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. We're starting a brand new series today as we roll into Vision Month. We have a, a Vision Week actually next week. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be just an opportunity for us to unroll a little bit more of what we're planning uh, in 2022. How many think plans are a good thing to have? The Bible says that we make our plans, but Lord establishes our paths. What I will tell you is that God can't bless what you don't even put any effort into, and so we should have plans, okay? And so... Uh, Let's get into this message. As I was thinking about uh, this unshakable nature, today we're going to talk about the unshakable kingdom. You know, throughout history, we see kingdoms rise and empires fall. We chart the rise and fall based on many things, don't we? But really, oftentimes it boils down to this unquenchable desire for humanity or mankind to want more power. So they'll go after it. Or on the flip side, we see the desire for mankind to be for, want to be free. So they fight for that, right? But we see this rising and falling of empires. We, we look through our history books. Anyone in here a history buff? Anyone in here really enjoy history? Anyone in here stay awake during those classes? You know, uh, for the rest of you, I guess you'll be repeating history. Um, but what I do know is that when we look through our history books, we see the rise and fall of kingdoms and empires such as the Aegean, the Egyptian, the Assyrian, the Persian, the Roman, the Byzantine, the Mongolian, the Ottoman, the Chinese, the Napoleon, and even the British Empire. We, there's more than that, but I thought you'd be good with that exhausted list. Okay, what does our history teach us? If you're taking notes, 10,000 points in the game of life, all earthly powers, people, and kingdoms are shakable. So what does that mean? It means only God's kingdom is unshakable. Even the power and the success that the United States has seen over our short history of eh, two to three hundred years is also in danger of seeing a great shaking. This isn't to create an alarm. I think the alarm has already been ringing for quite a while now. I believe more and more are beginning to hear it. This is not necessarily a political statement, but many would certainly agree with the thought that our political system in general, those holding power on both sides of the aisle, are failing us. But that shouldn't be a surprise. Why? Because the Bible tells us there will be a great shaking in the last days. Whenever or what, I should say, whether you believe this to be the last days or the latter days, we know it's another day closer to the end than it is the beginning. So before you go, oh, great, here we go, end day talk. This is just you know, wonderful. I, can't, I didn't have enough coffee for this day. <laughs> How about we actually focus a little bit more on the end than we do the beginning? How about we focus a little bit more on what God's word says about the days that are coming than the days we hope will come? I know we're all hoping for this pandemic to become an endemic, and I believe it is. 
I believe it is. I think as we continue to turn on the TV and see Super Bowls filled up and see people in stadiums in 60, 70,000 with no masks and the rest, I'm not saying politically that this is one way or another. I just simply say people clearly are moving on. Amen. Thank you, wave. But listen, God tells us there will be a great shaking. There will be a great shaking. Look what it says in Hebrews 12. It says, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen? Amen. The shaking we have seen through history, the rising and the falling of empires, the instability of our current world should stir a great awakening to grasp these facts. Are you ready? Number one, a greater shaking is coming. A greater shaking is coming. Again, not trying to cause an alarm, just trying to wake some of you up. Some of you don't need much of an alarm in the morning. Some of you need to be hit by a shoe. Some of you need your spouse to call you after they've left the house to be sure you're awake. Some of you need, you know, some sort of invention that drops a hammer or a slap across your cheek. For me, I'm just trying to help you understand a shaking is coming. We want to believe things will continue to improve. I get it. Who, who wouldn't want hope for a better world, especially to raise our children in? But we should not allow our hope to silence God's warning. I'm going to say that again. We should not allow our hope to silence God's warning. Inevitably, things will shake again. Hebrews 12, 26, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. What will this look like when I start to think about that? You know, how will we know when it is upon us? We see Jesus talking to people about the end of the age and his second coming. And then the disciples ask him privately, like, hey, what will the signs be when you come back? Like, well, when will we know it's the end of the age? And now I don't have the time to go into right now, this moment, a series on the end times. That would have to be uh, quite a long series. And I, if, if you're interested, then yeah, we'll go there for sure. Okay, but right now I'm going to try and give you a, a short synopsis of some things that Jesus was talking about, right? So Jesus refers to the shaking will come in stages. He's equating them to birth pains, building more and more until the end finally comes. Matthew 24, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, what will happen? Uh, when will this happen? And what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginning of birth pains. I could continue reading that whole chapter, and I encourage you, actually, go and read the whole chapter. But again, for the moment, let's stop their understanding. As the end draws nearer, there will be greater shakings to our world, and many will fall away on account of not being rooted in the kingdom. Many will fall away. Look, uh, in, in, uh, that's why when Jesus is talking about blessing, or when, the, or when the scripture is talking to us about blessing, it refers to those who are planted in the house, rooted in in the house. Have you ever tried to uproot something that's really well rooted? 
So when I, when I bought this house uh, probably eight or nine years ago that Julie and I are living in, our first home, we wa- you know, you, you show up and it's your first home and there's a lot of work to be done. You know what I mean? This guy didn't win the lottery. A lot of work to be done, okay? And so as we're walking up to the house and we're seeing all the things we want to change, uh, one of them is kind of the hideous bushes in the front of the house, you know? They weren't hideous the time they were planted, but the time they were planted to now, people have died. (laughs) It's been a long time, okay? And so we're like, all right, we got to get rid of these things. And so no big deal. We're just going to, you know, uproot it. We're just going to pull it out by the, the ball and we're going we're gonna to grab it. So we had a friend bring a truck over and we're trying to uproot this thing. I'm telling you, it would have been easier to move the house. <laughs> in fact, I was worried that in moving this thing and trying to uproot it, I was going to mess up the house's foundation because is this thing attached? How's, why is this truck not moving this bush? told Julie, maybe this was the burning bush. Maybe somehow it showed up over here. Maybe it's to be here for eternity. Maybe we're just going to have to leave this one. It took forever to uproot this thing. And then it hit me. That's what it's like when true believers root themselves in the house of God. When a great shakening happens, when things start to move, they're immovable. Not because their character's not flawed, not because they're perfect, but because they're rooted in something that is unshakable. Are you getting this, church? What is the purpose of this shaking? Why is God going to create a greater shaking? To reveal that which is unshakable. To reveal that which is unshakable. Has anyone ever looked around the world and just looked at all the things on the news and looked at the stuff that maybe your kids are dealing with that you didn't have to deal with. And, and you just get to this place where you've got this like, I would call it a holy anger, this righteous indignation. You just get frustrated. You just want to see justice. You just want to see the world go to a place where, uh, where I can be happy because God's happy and this stuff is not happening the way it's happening. Is, any, is that just me? No, no. I'm telling you. So why on earth would there be a great shaking? Because God is going to sift out and he's going to bring justice. God is going to allow the shakening to create an awakening. He's going to allow the birth pains to birth something that is eternal. When God creates a shaking, it's to reveal that which is unshakable. It's to, uh, to uh, God is allowed to be the judge, by the way. Someone thinks, you know, sometimes you hear people say, only God can judge me, and I have to remind them that he will. I know, but he's going to, so that should really wake us up. And so if God is the judge, if this is something that he has the ability to say, you know what, enough's enough, justice is coming, then how he chooses to do it is up to him because he created everything. Right? And so... Again, why is this going to happen? Because he wants to reveal that which is unshakable. Number two, what is that? Only God's kingdom is unshakable. Only God's kingdom is unshakable. The only thing that will last when everything else is passed will be God's unshakable kingdom. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful And so worship God acceptably and reverence and awe. You know, I think about this scripture oftentimes when I come in and I prepare to worship God in his auditorium, his sanctuary, in his church. I oftentimes think, am I going to worship God acceptably based on what he's given me? Am I going to stand hands in the pocket not paying attention because after all this is just a portion of the service that's going to end and then I'll sit down and actually listen? Or am I going to say, man, what God is giving me, I'm going to worship him in an acceptable manner. I'm going to lean in. I'm going to give him something from me that no one else gets. I'm going to worship him in spirit and truth. I am not going to just sit idly and give my idols the worship. Oh, you act, like, you act like you don't have an idol. <laughs> Think, it'll come to you. That which just came to you was probably conviction. Go do something about it. For those of us who have received the king, 
and are building his kingdom. We are part of this unshakable kingdom. God's kingdom is immovable. When God begins shaking our world, it will move that which is movable and leave the immovable. Has anybody watched those you know, the gold digger shows, the people that are panning for gold. The, they're, they're out there and they're, they're living the dream trying to find that tiny little shiny thing. And what are they doing? They're using the sieve, right? And so what are they, they're scooping up out of the rock bed, out, out of the water, wherever they're pulling the stuff from, and they start to shake. They start to shake. And, and guess what? Anything small enough, anything that is not worth anything begins to fall through. Leaving and revealing that which is most desirable, that which is most valuable. Someone would say, hey, that's not very nice to claim that, that uh, you know, one is more valuable than to the other. I would say that you're right. When it comes to raw value, we're all equally valuable. But when it comes to those who God's going to save, that's based on who thought Jesus was valuable and actually lived accordingly. Right? And so Matthew 24 Again, once more indicates the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. I often, I was thinking, um, you know, I'm not a real baker. I'm a great eater though. Um, so normally my wife and I, we have this awesome thing where she does the baking and I do a lot of the eating, you know. Uh, but she's got one of those things where, you know, you kind of like hit it on the side and it does all the cool powdered sugar and it releases some of those things. I was going to come up here and try and do all the. I was just going to end up with it all over my shirt. The point is this. You can do a good shaking and certain things will fall out, but there are things as, as you grow, as you build all the, the stuff that is growing in you, the more we lean in, the more kingdom is in us. Guess what? We, we're receiving this kingdom. We're un unshakable. And so although everything else may fall around us, although everyone else's hope may uh, falter and fail, we have this ability to hold on to the sweet Jesus that has changed everything. Hello? Okay. What can be shaken out will, leaving the unshakable only. Number three, God's unshakable kingdom is internal. Oftentimes we, we think like, okay, well, if there's a kingdom, I want to be a part of it. How do I receive the kingdom of God? How can we be sure that we have done just that? Let me just for a minute ask you a question. I don't expect you to fully respond. It'd be weird if all of you responded individually and just you guys can respond in your own mind, your own hearts. Let me ask you this question. Was Jesus the kingdom of God embodied? Hopefully your answer is yes, and it is yes, and this was all important and very necessary. Why? For without the embodiment of the kingdom of God in a person, we would have read into the term kingdom of God. Our preconceptions of the kingdom, which would uh, all end up being incorrect and inadequate if there wasn't the embodiment in Jesus. We had to see the kingdom in operation in a person. It had to be made concrete or it, would be, it wouldn't be conceived. We wouldn't understand it, right? We had to see the kingdom of God operating in a person. And Jesus is the kingdom of God wearing sandals and walking. The kingdom and the person belong together. For without the person illustrating the kingdom, the kingdom pattern would have taken many different directions with all the sorts of meanings, and actually it kind of already has if you start to look at all the different denominational ties and changes and, and, and shifts and all of the rest, right? Think of how many more there would be if there wasn't an actual Jesus to say, no, this is how you do it. Are you following me? So let me say it like this. Jesus is the king, he is the kingdom, and our key. This is the exact reason why the world wants to silence the name of Jesus. This is the exact reason you can pray to anyone you want except Jesus in the world that we live in. This is the exact reason why, why they can teach anything in our public school systems, but they can't teach Jesus. Why? Because he's the only one that matters. This is not politically correct. I don't care. This is truth. And you're going to have to decide who Jesus is to you. But what I need to help you understand is God sent the king, God robed in flesh, to come down and show us what the kingdom of God is, who it is, what it's like. Why? 
so that we could be part of the kingdom. But how do we become part of the kingdom? Through Jesus, who is our key, our access points. Are you with me? Romans 5 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we're talking about how the unshakable kingdom's internal, right? We've been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through who? Jesus Christ. Through whom we have gained access, the key, by what? Faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the key to the kingdom. And he is the king all wrapped in one. But guess what? It's an eternal thing. The unshakable kingdom of God dwells in us because it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Are you seeing this? The kingdom is internal. It's why circumcision of the flesh is no longer required. Some people said, amen. Because the New Testament makes clear it becomes a circumcision of the heart. It's internal. Romans 2, 28 and 29. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew. Why are we referring to Jew? Because these are God's people, right? So, no, a person is one of God's people who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Look at, if we don't understand... We're not always going to get it right out here in the world as we walk and talk and deal with that person who we want to bless with a brick. And Lord, help me. Help me be more like your son so I don't have those thoughts towards that person. As we continue to move through life and we're trying to become more like the son because we need to be more like the son. Oh, you too. We need to remember that what is happening outwardly is flowing something that, from something that is inward. And how many understand if you don't water the plant, it's not going to grow? You remember my little experiment of like my little dead plant that's still alive? I told you a few weeks ago, unfortunately, some of your faith is kind of the same thing where you water it only a little bit once a week and you think that you're, you're like, hey, I'm good, but actually you're surviving, but you're not thriving. Right, my little, my, uh, my daughter is like, is that thing finally dead? I'm like, no, see that one green leaf? See that one green leaf? And I add a little bit of water. So how, that is just not right. Listen, the whole concept is this. Whatever's happening inside the roots is going to show outside the plant. It's going to show as the fruits, right? And so what I'm trying to help you understand is we don't just come to church outwardly and think it's making a complete difference and radical change. It does make a difference and it does make a change. But if you're not doing it from the inside, if you're not in your word, if you're not around the right people, encouraging the right thing, if you're not allowing this thing inside to continue to grow and develop, you're going to have that one little green leaf. You Christian? Oh yeah. You see that right there? One little green leaf. Hey, COVID, all rules are out. Man bun, I don't know, I like Cinnabons, let's roll with it. Listen, when we say yes to Jesus, there's a cutting away inwardly inside of us. God removes our sin through his son, Jesus. That's an amazing thing. But we have to understand it's something happening on the inside. Eventually, we should see some green leaves. Eventually, we should see some life change. We should see some transformation that comes from a renewing of a mind that should be done daily, not once weekly. Okay. Number four, God's unshakable kingdom is not only internal, it's eternal. Daniel 7, 18 says this, the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever forever. That is a good thing. But oftentimes we don't really consider the forever thing based on how we're living right now. And what I mean by that is our lives, they're a blip on the radar. What we have, all that we give, all of our energy, our resources, what we're building here, uh, you know, it's, it's equated to just a sandcastle. How many spend the whole day, I, I'll tell you, I've raised these kids uh, at the beaches here around the Cape and bringing them. I love the beach. My wife and I love the beach. We don't even care if our kids love the beach. We're going to the beach. They're coming with us. In fact, they may have a disdain for the beach now based on how many times we bring them to the beach. 
whatever. The point is this. We'll spend all day making a sandcastle that when high tide comes, it's gone. But I'm telling you, this thing looked immaculate. We found dead crabs, and it was like the crab kingdom. You put that thing on top. You've got flags. You do rocks and shells. This thing is immaculate. I mean, yeah, I build sandcastles. But at the end of the day, when that high tide comes and the whole thing washes away, every time it happens, it reminds me that's exactly what our life is like. Next time you're at the beach and you see the remainder, just the remaining bits of a sandcastle that clearly was hit over, that's going to be your life one day. Everything we've spent our whole life building, unless it was kingdom focused, it's just going to be rubble. It's just going to be sifted. It's just going to be where moth and rust destroy. It's, it's, it's literally going to be gone. You know, watching... Watching family members go through struggles when, when the patriarch or the matriarch finally pass and then people are fighting over what was left because there was a large sum worth fighting for. I'm pretty sure those people that left the money didn't assume it would be the very thing that caused problems in the family. I'm not saying you shouldn't leave something for your children. I believe biblically it's, we need to be considering things like that. But just realize that what we're building today only matters if it's unshakable. It only matters if it's put in the right place. It only matters if it's going to be something that when everything is shaken, it remains. Are you getting this? The only thing temporal is our earthly body. What we live for, we live with for eternity. What we live for, we live with for eternity. First Peter 1 says this, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Can never perish, spoil, or fade. This is an eternal thing that we have received. It's an eternal thing that we're investing in. It's an eternal thing that we decide, I'm going to live this day. I'm going to live this life for God, who at the end of the day, I'll stand before based on what I've done. The parable of the talents. Does it keep you awake at night? Who Gets me sometimes. God, am I doing enough with what you put in me? Am I investing it for the sake of your kingdom and for advancing your, uh, your name and for your glory I almost just said something I can't say. Or am I just freelancing it out to a world with no return for your kingdom? Am I just burying it and sitting on it because of my insecurities and anxiety? I'm not saying that there's not a reality and those things could be keeping you back, but I would tell you that there's a God can heal you and help you through those things so that you can do all that God's called you to be and do, Right? Those who have persevered are promised a heavenly reward of eternal rest in God's kingdom. That is why God's word tells us we are foreigners on this earth. Hence what? Christians are citizens of heaven, it says in Philippians 3. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. What are we saying? Let's keep the eyes on the prize. Are we living for eternity? Do we understand it's an internal thing? And even though we can't fully see it, God can. And one day we're going to be judged based upon it, according to it. His word is left for us so that we could live a life that would bless his name and we would be ambassadors for Christ on this earth, understanding our final resting place isn't here anyway. Oftentimes, you know, there's, there's, you know, how can I say this gently? There's, there's a nature all around the world to go back and visit graves. And that's fine if, if you want to do that, but just realize they're not there. Why? Because the scripture tells us that. That's not to, to steal something from you. It's to help you understand to live according to the fact that when you're gone, you won't be there either. You'll stand before God and be judged based on how you lived. So let's focus on living well and honoring those people that have passed, honoring all the good that they passed on to us, letting a little of them live through us based on how well we live, so to speak. But let's also be very clear, they're not there anymore. 
Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That was Jesus. So in closing, before the end of the age, God is giving to everyone who believes in his son a kingdom that is unshakable, one that will never end. This message is out of the, it's, it's the message you see in the whole Bible. But to see it, we should look back at verse 28 of our text. Therefore, let us be grateful receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I love it, and we should notice the fact that it says receiving. We've already received it. It's in the process. He's here. All these things. Maybe today you'll receive it for the first time. The fact that you can say yes to Jesus. Then it goes on to say in verse 27, Things will be shaken and will be swept away in one last great shaking. And that which is unshakable will remain. The verse 28 says we've already received the unshakable kingdom. This is the great joy of being a Christian. It doesn't matter whether you live in the Boston or the boroughs or the banks of Bangladesh. You have a kingdom which has been given to you and your life in Christ is unshakable. So the questions that I asked you is, are you worshiping the unshakable God or are you worshiping shakable possessions? Is your heart fixed on God? Is, your, is God your treasure or is the world your treasure? Is God your security or is your retirement plan your security? So easy to get wrapped up in our personal goals that we can lose sight of God's eternal plans, plans that need our time and our energy and our attention when we spend our lives, effort, energy, and resources building an unshakable kingdom that is forever, we will enjoy our reward for eternity. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let's be sure we are counted as part of God's kingdom and that we are found building his kingdom when he returns. I know that God loves you very much. I know that when he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, he was thinking of you. I believe everything is personal when it comes to God, and I believe we need to make our faith personal through Jesus. Earlier today, I made a mention that Jesus is the only one. He is not only the king, he is the kingdom, and he is our key to enter. We always... Hear people refer of, I just hope I lived good enough to enter the pearly gates. You'll never be good enough to enter the gates of heaven. If you could ever do anything to be good enough, Jesus wouldn't have needed to come. The fact that he came proves none of us will ever be good enough. It's a fact. But we also know no one else came for us. It was only Jesus that came and lived a sinless life so that he could die on a cross for our sin. It's his perfect sinless life. His sinless blood as the spotless lamb, he was given as a sacrifice. See, in the Old Testament, every time someone uh, committed a sin, they had to bring an animal into the house of God. They had to see an animal sacrificed so that the animal's sinless blood, who doesn't have a soul or doesn't know right or wrong, that that sinless blood would actually cover the sin of the human. And this happened for generations and generations. And finally, God said, we're not doing this anymore. I'm going to do it once and for all. I'm going to send my only son who, rather than some animal that, that, that is just going to be slaughtered, I'm going to send my only son who lived the perfect life. He's going to fulfill the Old Testament. He's going to fulfill the, the uh, commandments. He's going to fulfill everything. And when he finally sheds that blood for those people, if they choose to accept what he did, I will see that blood cover their sin once and for all. And they will become part of his unshakable kingdom. They will be more than just my creation. They will be with me for eternity. They will be family. They will be co-heirs with Christ. Everything will change because they accepted my son, my one and only son. So today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this place, if you're on the other side of the screen, if you're listening to this wherever you are, who is Jesus to you? Because that one question determines everything. You've got to make a decision. Today, would you say yes to Jesus? 
Today, would you choose to make Jesus your Lord and Savior? Will you take a moment and say, well, I don't understand everything, God, but I know I need you. And today I ask Jesus to be mine. I know he gave everything for me, but today I make that decision for him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today, if you're hearing this wherever you are, if you're saying, Pastor Chad, include me in that prayer, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer right now. And you can repeat the words after me. This is something that they may be words I'm helping you with, but God's hearing it from your heart, and that's what changes everything. So if you're saying, Pastor Chad, include me in that prayer. Maybe you know you've walked away from God. You haven't been living the life he called you to, and you need to ask for forgiveness and say, God, I'm back. That's amazing. Prodigal's coming home today. But maybe you've never said yes to Jesus, and you're saying, this is the time. I, I understand it as much as I can. I now get it. If that's you, while no one else is looking around, quickly, just slip up your hand and say, yeah. I see that hand. Yeah. I see that hand. Amazing. Amazing. And if that's you at home, come on, we're all going to say this prayer together. Let's say, God, I thank you that you love me so much. Even in all of my unlovable moments, you still look on me with love. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. I don't know everything, but I know I need him. I ask you today, Jesus, come into my heart. Father, forgive me. And Holy Spirit, help me to live this life you created me for. I'm going to need a lot of help. But today, I give you my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can we give a huge hand to all those that made that decision? How exciting is that? Look, you may not even feel all that different, but I'll tell you, God sees you differently, and that's all that matters. Today, why don't you go tell somebody about the decision you made? Whether you raise your hand or not, if you made that decision, God heard your hearts, and everything's changed. We as a church, we want to do more than just clap for you. We actually want to help you along in this faith journey. There are books in the seat back in front of you that we'd love for you to take. If you're online, message us saying you'd like one of these books that you made a decision. We'll send it to you. But listen, church. Remember, the unshakable kingdom is internal. It's eternal. But we've got to take hold of all that God has for us. Let's stop living lives eyes shut, but instead wide open. Did you receive the word? Yeah. Amen. Church, know that I love you. I'm praying for you, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you so much for being with us today. We hope you were encouraged and challenged by that powerful message. If you made that decision for the first time, I want to say congratulations. Here's how we can help. First, email info at metrochurch.tv, letting us know that you made that decision. And we'll send you this free book called What on Earth Am I Here For? which talks about the purpose that God has for your life. Our office will also send you information about our diving class, which is a four-week series that we offer here at Metro Church. If you missed the beginning of this service and would still like to participate in giving, you can do so through our app or through our website. We will also have generosity boxes available by the exit doors. For those of you that joined us for the first time today, don't forget to pick up a blue gift bag on your way out. As always, if you need prayer for absolutely anything, please email us at info at metrochurch.tv. We would love to pray and believe with you. Thank you again for being with us today. We love you, Metro Church, and cannot wait to see you again next week. It's me again, and I just...